Um, I am Judy Rutenberg, Program Director at the Association of Research Libraries. Um, and I uh, have directed, for the last three and a half years, a program called Transforming Research Libraries, which is a complicated portfolio of a lot of activities, but um, almost every conversation leads pretty quickly to a transforming workforce. So this is a lot of what, um, uh, where this effort has, has come from. So how did we get here to Cornell in this beautiful um, day and, and couple of days together? Um, there was a report um, published through by ARL by Karen Williams and Janice Jagoshevsky at uh, the University of Minnesota. New Roles for New Times, Transforming Liaison Roles in Research Libraries. And very well received, the report was a long time coming and it had, had a, a couple of publications leading up to it. Anne Kenny's um, Ithaca SNR brief that she just mentioned. Um, and the initiative of, of Rita Vine um, and others who uh, came to ARL and said, there's something here to talk about in a broad way. There's some, there's some need to get the community together around this liaison issue. And so we had two meetings, um, one at ALA Midwinter in Philadelphia, another one at Annual and, um, in Las Vegas. And uh, more than, you know, something like 50 or 60 people came to those meetings who were, um, who were the supervisors or leaders of liaison programs in ARL libraries. Um, really, really wanting to talk about this issue. And so, and, and many of the things that Anne mentioned came up in those meetings. And then as Anne mentioned as well, we convened a smaller group of people, um, Barbara, Rita uh, among them, um, in October at ARL to talk further about, okay, what, what are we gonna do as a community around these big important questions of, about what is liaison? So that's recently how we got here. But of course, this is a longer conversation. Um, and it's a long conversation among all types of academic libraries. So um, I'm focused on ARL libraries, but um, there's a, a long literature and many conference presentations and many types of libraries have talked about this role of liaison. But in ARL, um, before the Janice and Karen's report, um, they had done a, a, a research library issues brief in 2009. Um, there was a spec survey in 2007, and then one in 1992, Liaison Services, which was really interesting to look back at. Um, and then, of course, this comes, so the conversation goes far back, um, and it goes forward, right? Anne, um, Anne published in, um, in March a piece in College and Research Libraries, which I think you've read as part of the preparation for this. And we have a forthcoming spec survey, so 92, 2007, and, and 2015. So this spec survey should hit your campus in July. Hopefully many of you in the room will participate in it. The re it will be published in November, the report, and then they'll be kind of webcast in December. So, you know, we've been, we've been looking at this for a while, <laughs> the question of what a liaison librarian does. Okay, oh, and then of course, um, just reading last night and over the last week or so, the, the University of Toronto's report. Um, which I think also pushed that, uh, reported the assessment of your librarian program, or liaison program, which adds further to this conversation. So I thought I would look a little bit at um, the ARL's data. You know, we, that's what we do as an association. We collect data about our industry. So who are you, liaison, not you in this room, but you, you broadly, <laughs> the 18% um, the of, of, of our professional workforce in ARL University Libraries, about the 10,000 or so total professionals in libraries, 18% are identify as subject specialist, um, and with an average of about 16 years of experience in the profession, and that, that average is right, right in line with the, the rest of positions, so that's, that's right there. Um, and according to the most recent salary survey, this is how you break down, no subgroup, pretty big group of you. Um, and then you can see the rest of how, um, how you shake down in terms of the, the subject areas that you are specialists for. Um, so in, this is, has a mistake in it, which I prepared, I changed on my own slides, but this is actually from 2010. Um, the salary survey we do every year in every five years, so including the, in 2010 and then this year, um, we collect further information about the workforce, including educational attainment. So in addition to um, MLIS, subject uh, liaison librarians, 29% um, of you have a subject master's. 14% um, of you have a doctorate in a field other than library and information science, and 1.4% of you have a PhD in LIS. Um, and so I was talking with Rita last night, and 
uh, this is, I think, the subject masters. The, su the second subject masters is less common in Canada, as I'm led to understand. So it would be. So had I known that when I prepared the slide, I might have done just to see what how that changed the percentage if we had just done the U.S. Um, ARL member libraries. But this includes both. So um, I'm not sure how that number would change. But it was a little less than I thought. So that was sort of interesting. It was it was a surprise to me. Um, but of course, you're not just subject specialists. That's not all who in the in the room here today, and not all who are responsible for liaison programs. So there are we also um, some of you are digital specialists, and here are uh, the groups that you can see, and how they how they break down. Um, and this. Uh, um, all, some of you are uh, functional specialists, and these are new new job codes in the last couple of years. Um, uh, archivists are, are a huge sub subgroup of functional specialists, um, but some of you. So hopefully, um, with these, we've captured just about everybody who's in the room. Anybody not see what they do in these? Okay, good. So, as I said, this conversation's been going on for quite some time, and so I want to look back at the the view from 1992 and why we were concerned about liaison programs back then. Um, it was the dawn of networked digital networked information. This is, can you see the University of Iowa's library webpage in <laughs> 1992? Which is, who remembers Gopher? At the time, it was awesome, right? I mean, it was what we had. And so, but here's what they said in the spec kit, in, an, in a setting where access to information is infinite. The role of the liaison as a knowledgeable guide grows in importance, and that's what they were talking about in 1992, and I think that's amazing. Um, so, and it was also pretty forward-looking speculation about what, why we were looking at this program. So they talked about assessment. They, in that 1992 spec kit, talked about um, we are going to need to figure out how to assess the effectiveness of this activity. Um, and they talked about expanding roles for liaisons as contributing members of research teams and instructional programs. Um, so this video, it's linked to a video, hope maybe you've seen it, but when we published the New Roles for New Times report, Janice and Karen's report in 2013, um, they did this lovely video with Jonathan Kofel, who's a, a medical librarian at the University of Minnesota. I don't think you can see that. It says, I think a, a few of the interesting things that I've been working on lately, or novel things, um, is with the residents. I participate in, in morning report and, round, and patient rounding. So, but, you know, which sounds really, it's, it's really out there, and yet they were talking about that, I think, um, could, or could envision a situation far out where, where this is what, how embedded liaisons would be. So, great video if you haven't seen it. So what else is going on in 1992? Michael Buckland publishes his pretty visionary um, uh, manifesto redesigning library services, talking about the transition from an automated library to an electronic library. Um, and then, again, the spec kit as the physical collection becomes less central. Gopher, I just said gopher. The user is becoming the focus of library services. And in that 2013 New Roles for New Times report, um, this was, uh, again, you sort of see echoes of talking about the engagement model as less about what um, librarians do and more about what, you know, collection development, teaching, outreach, and more about what users do, research, teaching, and learning, and how we can support that. But again, user becoming the focus of library services. So here's a library liaison job description from, because we collect that in the spec kits, from 1992. And it's pretty traditionally uh, framed, I think. Liaisons will become familiar with instructional programs, um, become aware of programmatic developments in current research, keep department informed, um, and is available for, for assistance with um, for faculty and graduate students. Okay, so that's a pretty traditional looking library liaison job description. So going ahead now, so the next time we, we really do a survey with the membership is in 2007. And uh, lots of talk about what the challenges for liaisons um, include. And these probably look familiar to you, time constraints, competing responsibilities for what you have to do, too many departments or departments outside expertise. So I have, I was a liaison librarian once, I have a master's in library science, I have a master's degree in African American history, I was the liaison to the nursing department, to cognitive sciences, to um, criminology, law, and society, and for um, African American studies. That was a treat. Um, so, uh, but you know, this is how this is the reality, right, of, of many of you who do subject liaison work. 
And then keeping up with changes, that was a, reported as a high challenge, keeping up with changes in pedagogy, in digital technology, in the disciplines themselves. Um, these were, were what liaison librarians felt were challenging them. And it was an interesting shift. The noted, what was noted in 2007, because they had gone back to look at the, at the 1992 spec kit. I don't know if you can read that, but I just liked the charmingness of the 1992 publication. But um, what we had was, uh, so, you know, unreceptive faculty can't get their attention. That, that's a problem. But um, over-demanding faculty was, was one of the, you know, they just want too much from us um, in, in 92. And then by 2007, you really don't see that over-demanding faculty. You see this overwhelming um, notion of we are trying to get their attention and so sort of what Anne said, the blogs, the emails, the notices, the alerts, it's like there's, we're trying to get, get in there to some very, very busy people and get, and establishing and maintaining contact is this, is this concern. So here's the jo job description from 2007 which really reflects that urgency of getting in front of faculty. A high level of proactive interaction is essential. Seek opportunities, <laughs> this is in the job description, for partnerships with, with assigned departments. So they're, you know, recruiting for this position are very aware that this is an issue. And then this I just love because look at this mandate for liaison. Analyze trends, keep current with the scholarship, and use this knowledge to respond to departmental needs. That is the challenge, right? So, you know, in the last few years, we really have been looking, um, talking about this engagement framework. The University of Minnesota developed the position description framework. Um, and talked about and um, modeled and um, and uh, built upon by many other libraries, um, and echoing the slide you saw earlier from Anne, the the really models of what kind what engagement looks like, and how many of you feel like you are involved in multiple of these activities that you see here, just by a show of hands, more than one, yeah, okay, more than two, okay, good, <laughs> I won't go all the way through that. Um, but this is what, what liaison or engagement looks like. So what we heard in 2014 at ALA, when we had those two meetings, when we brought a smaller group together in DC, um, uh, need to clarify service expectations. And I saw this in the Toronto report. You know, really, it, what are the levels of service? What are we, you know, how can we agree on that? Um, needing to rebalance responsibilities. Um, people are sliced in just too many different ways. Um, and can't become the kind of experts that they want to be um, in, in those different areas. Um, again, the importance of teams. And um, also, if you haven't, has everybody here read the Toronto report? Has it been? Okay, well, I encourage you to do that it, um, if you haven't, but the importance of teams um, and the way it's expressed in that report, teams, not just static teams of people who, you know, you were on this team, you do this service, but teams that are brought together to solve a problem, right? To say, no one person can, can provide all the services that are required by a department, a discipline, um, a faculty member. Um, what can, you know, you have a pressing need to partner in digital scholarship and something. We need to get the right people together and it's going to be a copyright person and it's going to be a digital specialist and it's going to be someone with subject expertise and we're going to be a team to solve that. Um, the importance of, or the need for training as these, as um, new responsibilities are called for, how, how are we going to provide training and a great need for tools and tools that would that the community can use and embrace um, for assessment, customer service, and collaboration. So this is a lot of what we heard again that kind of has led to us being here together. So a job description, I like job descriptions, in, to, in from 2015. Um, also again, you see reflecting what where this direction is going. So you insert whatever subject you work in, um, but coordinates discipline services provided by a team, um, uh, investigate and integrate creative or emerging te uh, technologies and services into the library. And then you see, you know, data support services for faculty, but invoking teams quite outside, um, outside the library and on campus itself. And then this one recently, uh, there were four librarian, four uh, science librarian positions advertised at UC Davis. And this is really also it, right? be able to work to effectively with faculty, students, research, and staff to develop a shared vision for library services and collections aligned with the university's mission and vision. Um, this is the, the uh, present day expectation of liaison, right? So we are here, gathered here. We have fabulous energy, commitment on the part of your directors to bring you here um, and on the part of you to get on buses and, and come here and spend a couple of days here um, and helping write the next part of the story. 
Um, and here are just some of the, the questions I would urge you to think about um, as with our time together. Who, what will your primary responsibilities be? Um, how will liaison be described? How do you envision it will be described? We'll see this next BET kit come out this, this year. What skills will you need? How will you get it? Um, what tools do you need to do your job? And who is on your team? Um, for the kinds of uh, the kinds of activities and the kinds of engagement you're going to be doing with um, with your students and faculty. So that's it. Thank you very much.